Good evening, everybody. My name is Lauren Parra. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for the Miami Foundation, and I am so happy to welcome you all to yet another series in our, our Miami The People's Forum event. If you can, please give us just a few minutes. We're going to allow all of our registrants to log in and get going with tonight's event. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us and to kick us off for the evening, I'd like to introduce Rebecca Fishman Lipsy, President and CEO of the Miami Foundation. Good evening and welcome to the Our Miami The People's Forum, tonight focused on the runoff for Miami-Dade County Mayor. I'm Rebecca Fishman Lipsy president and CEO of the Miami Foundation. This is a nonpartisan countywide position representing all 2.7 million residents in Miami-Dade County. And the question is, what values are most important to you heading into this election? Over 67,000 people have tuned into these Our Miami, the People Forums. And we hope that every single one of you shows up to vote 
And today is the last day that you can register to vote. And if you care enough to be here, then hopefully you care enough to double check that you are registered. You can find that link at votemiami.org, as well as information about every candidate that's running in Miami-Dade County. I wanna thank the coalition of nonprofits that has helped us uh, to source hundreds of questions for tonight's forum. I wanna thank the staff and the board at the Miami Foundation for putting muscle into tonight's event. And I wanna thank WPLG Local 10 for elevating this conversation. We know at the Miami Foundation that civically engaged communities are stronger, they're healthier, they're more resilient, and you being here tonight to be informed and engaged about our local elections really matters. So thank you for strengthening Miami. And to the candidates, Commissioner Bovo and Commissioner Livin Kava, I have so much respect for you both. Thank you for being here to share your visions for the future of Miami. And with that, I'm excited to pass the mic to Calvin Hughes, who's our moderator for this evening from WPLG Local 10. Hello. <laughs> They're asking me, am I on? Yes. They're ready for you to go, sir. Oh, what, what should I do? Oh, should I begin? Okay, I can begin. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't hear Rebecca's opening statement. Um, let me make sure I have everybody. I'm sorry. Commissioners, are you there? I don't see them, and I apologize. Oh, there you are. Okay, all right, there they are. Okay, I didn't hear the opening statements, but I'll say thank you all for joining us uh, tonight. And uh, first, a special thanks to the Miami Foundation for uh, Greater Miami for hosting this event along with my employer on WPLG Local 10 News. And thanks to the candidates as well, whom I will introduce shortly for taking time from their busy campaign schedules. Uh, my name is Calvin Hughes, evening anchor at Local 10 News. I am the moderator for this forum, and this is not a debate. This is a forum, if you haven't heard already. The candidates will have opening and closing statements that are 90 seconds long. At least the opening statement will be 90 seconds long. The closing statement will be two minutes long. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to respond to a question and 30 seconds for rebuttal at the moderator's uh, uh, direction and two minutes for, again, closing statements, as I mentioned. And so we're going to begin our forum right now. Uh, two Miami-Dade commissioners who beat out a number of candidates in their primary. Ladies first, always. So uh, Commissioner Daniela Levine Cava uh, and Esteban Steve Bobo. Thank you both for participating. I believe this is your third forum or slash debate in, what, four days? Has <laughs> have been quite busy. Um, yeah, so, so the issues have been shared with the candidates. I do want to let everyone at home know that, um, but not the questions, only the issues. So we're going to begin with the issue of governance. And uh, one question uh, that came from our studies and from uh, the body of people who are helping to uh, put this together, they said, if you were elected mayor, what post-COVID changes or initiatives would you put forth to ensure that our county doesn't just return to normal, but comes back stronger and more resilient to a crisis such as the coronavirus? Uh, Commissioner uh, Levine Kava, I'll begin with you. 
Thank you so much, Calvin, and thank you to the Miami Foundation. I just want to be sure, no opening comments, no opening I'm sorry, statement? I'm sorry, I, I totally jumped the gun. Uh, no Ms. worries. Ms. Kava, you go ahead with the opening statement. And then you <laughs> okay, I'm ready to okay. pivot whatever you uh, want me no, to do, I, no, no worries. You, you caught me, absolutely, go ahead, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good. So again, thank you. I'm Daniela Levine Kava, and I'm proudly running to be your county mayor with a clear vision and very detailed plans about how we will win the future. And through my 40 years of work in this community, I have seen the spirit of our people we are resilient, we are kind, and we are resolute. Uh, this year, we've been tested like never before as the global pandemic has ravaged our neighborhoods and exposed the growing issues that we all face. I'm very proud to have bipartisan support because my campaign is about common sense solutions. It's about nonpartisanship and not about division. Uh, I'm looking forward to bringing a new vision to County Hall, one that is matched with plans to tackle our most pressing issues, and so that we will come out stronger and, um, and more inclusive than we were before. Through my recover plan, I outline how we can uh, build back our local economy, come out stronger from the economic challenges that we face uh, in our businesses. And earlier this summer, I offered my secure plan on how we can bring the community together to get through the pandemic. And so for me, it starts with appointing a chief medical officer to guide us through the next phase of the, price, the crisis uh, and to ensure that our county leads with science and data. And so despite the challenges we face, uh, I am incredibly optimistic and I am incredibly optimistic about the future because of all of you. Right. Uh, you have inspired me and I am excited to earn your vote and win the future with you with vision, integrity and results. Thank Perfect. you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Bobo, please. Mission Abobo, can you hear me? Looks like his picture may have frozen there. I believe it did. Let's see if he can come back. Mission Abobo, if you can hear me, he may have to log off and then log back on. Yeah. I'm you, this is above my pay grade to deal with the technical issues. <laughs> if you would like me to answer the first question and then he could come back or not as you wish. Uh, no, I, yes, I, I think only, yeah, it's probably only fair if he does his opening statements like you, uh, Commissioner Collins. So if we could, maybe if he reboots and then comes back on, I think it's a fairly quick process. So we will uh, wait for him to come back. our new normal dealing with this. Let's see if he comes back on. What do you think, guys? Is he trying to come back on? Yes, he's trying to get back on, okay. All right, Commissioner Bovo, if you could hear me. If you can hear me. All right, hopefully um, he's gonna try to get back on here. It's been quite a news cycle, I tell you that. My gosh, with today the president coming back I'm going back to the White House and leaving Walter Reed. Okay, I'm 
texting these guys. So I'll be back in a few seconds. Um, for the people who are still logged in, I just want to remind you that today is the final day to register. Yeah, I think oh, it's like he's back. There he is. Today is the last day to register to vote. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I apologize. My uh, my Wi-Fi doesn't seem to be wanting to cooperate today. So okay, all right. Your opening statement, please, sir. Go ahead. Sure. Um, I think look, our county is uh, is is uh, coming to a crossroad. Uh, I think our county has not only uh, dealt with the challenges of COVID nineteen. Uh, the question is, how do we rebound from it? How do we navigate? Uh, what is, in my opinion, the most crucial period in, in perhaps our county's history over a long, long period of time. The government-induced coma on our economy that has affected uh, many aspects of it. It has affected uh, our tourism industry, a lesson learned that we're going to need to diversify our economy moving forward. We can't just solely rely on tourism. I have residents in my community that I represent who have been without work now for a seven-month period. It's really unsustainable. It's put a lot of pressure on them uh, in their homes, not to mention the mental health uh, crisis that it creates, as many people are very frustrated what they've been able to navigate with. You know, I think the next mayor, uh, when I'm elected mayor, I'm gonna work with the businesses in our community, work with the mayors across the, the globe of Miami-Dade County, the 30, uh, 34 municipalities, to come up with uniform ways on how to address uh, the reopening and the restart of our economy. You know, work directly with business owners, small business owners who've been ravaged. You know, and I know this story well. I was uh, raised in a small business. I saw what happened in that small business. Um, you know, the, uh, the meeting payroll, uh, paying contractors, and the challenges that those things would present when you couldn't do it. You know, the small business has been uh, uh, totally hit hard here, and we need to work with them directly. Uh, perhaps they could give us a pathway on how they could operate in a way that keeps their employees and their uh, customers safe. And then we enforce those rules that they help create. And as mayor, I think that should be the first and foremost uh, issue that we have All right. in uh, the recovery. Account. Okay, Commissioner, thank you. And, and I do want to follow up on something that you mentioned in your opening statement. You said government-induced coma on the economy. So you feel like it was the government's fault that this had to happen, or do you not feel like it was from the advice of the scientists and doctors who said it was necessary to shut everything down? Are you placing- Calvin, I think- uh, Go ahead, Commissioner. Calvin, I think in the, in the next uh, you know, year or two, when we revisit this and we re-examine, I think there were some instances where perhaps we, uh, we moved too rapidly to close things down instead of maybe enforcing some of the rules, mask wearing, social distancing, you know, we instantly went into businesses and closed them down and shut them down. And if it wasn't for the federal government pumping in money into our economy, uh, this was gonna, gonna be unsustainable. And uh, the, to be perfectly honest with you, I know people will call it a, an economic recession now. This was a government-induced recession, uh, obviously as a reaction to the pandemic. Uh, but as I said, I think when we come back and revisit the steps we have taken, uh, some may question whether we were too severe with some of the measures and perhaps we could have done it a little bit differently where it's not to not just create the panic that we've created in our, in our economy, the panic we've created in our homes, uh, kids being home without any access to education for a long time. It's been a huge disruptor and government was the one that uh, was pulling the levers here. And I understand it was clearly a reaction to what science was telling us Exactly. But, uh, I'm, gonna to, I'm gonna have to stop you there and get a response from Commissioner Levine Cava. Do you agree government induced or, or not government induced and was led by the, the, the data and from scientists and doctors? What do you think, Commissioner? Well, nobody expected a pandemic, right, Calvin? That was not uh, in our worldview. Uh, but once we understood that it was here, which was as early as March, and got guidance from the White House and the CDC, we were slow. Government was slow in Miami-Dade County to take the necessary steps. So unfortunately, because we did not put into place the testing, the contact tracing, and the isolation that was recommended from the outset, uh, more people died. We had, of course, especially in the populations of people in nursing homes and 
obviously in other facilities where people lived in close proximity. And uh, we thought initially that you had to have symptoms to get tested. And now we, of course, understood that those many people could be asymptomatic and spreading as well. So uh, I would say government acted too slowly and then we reopened too quickly and that led. So I don't call it government induced in the same way that uh, Mr. Bovo does, but I think that we could have been more effective at tamping down right away. Look at some of the places in the world that were more effective, uh, certainly in this country as well. And uh, 200,000 plus deaths later in this country, uh, I think we can say that our response was not uh, the best. Commissioner Bobo, if you were to give uh, Mayor Jimenez a grade on how he handled everything, what, what grade would you give him? I'd give him a, a B minus. Um, you know, I think, uh, again, it's, it's easy. It's very easy for folks uh, to play Monday morning quarterback and second guess and then kind of retinker everything. And, and that, that would be grossly unfair, to be perfectly honest with you. You know, I, I could only... Uh, imagine how I would have handled it and what I did in my seat as a commissioner in District 13. And what we did was instantly get testing because I knew testing was going to be the key to trying to get uh, at least a handle on this. So we not only set up testing sites immediately, I, got, I within weeks had started to put a group of folks together, business uh, educators and, uh, and healthcare workers to start giving advice on how a reopening, because we knew at some point you're going to be confronted with reopening your economy. You know, our system of life is not to be hunkered into, a, you know, into our homes and let the federal government pump in money and keep us afloat that way. It's just not in our DNA. And, and many of us are very wary about, you know, the impact this is going to have on our children, for example, getting back to school, uh, and the impact it had on many homes that didn't have that income uh, coming in and, and they were literally rudderless uh, trying to figure out how to make ends meet. Uh, Commissioner Levine Cava, uh, would you say that uh, Carlos Jimenez deserved a B minus or would you give him a higher or lower grade? Well, I think his, he was late. I think he's now come to a better understanding. Uh, and unfortunately now we've been, we've been preempted by our governor. Uh, you know, I think that this has become highly partisan. I think, unfortunately, there's been a, a desire to sort of hew to a narrative that, um, you know, doesn't really reflect the reality. Uh, you know, the virus has not gone away. We have not licked this disease. Um, fortunately, we have managed to reduce our positivity rate. Uh, the public is finally getting the clear message to mask. And I'm afraid that every time uh, we, we loosen up, we don't accompany it with adequate strictures on, yes, we must continue to mask, we must test, we must trace, we must isolate. I don't think that's, that's well understood. So I don't think that message is getting out and therefore the job is incomplete. Um, the cities, that was a disaster. Uh, you know, this came about not because uh, of money from the CARES Act that had to be distributed. It came about because there was no uh, collaborative relationship with the cities before COVID. We did not have a strong uh, relationship of joint planning. Uh, it was more regulatory in nature. Okay. And, and so I, I didn't hear a grade. So for Mayor Jimenez, what, what would you give him? Um, I think he's doing better now. At the beginning, very poor grade. Okay. Um, with the current economic downturn and reduction in property values due to COVID-19, how are you prepared to address the anticipated budget shortfall during your term in office? What services or programs would you prioritize and which ones, Commissioner Bovo, would you cut if elected? Well, this has been the crust of my campaign even before COVID-19. Uh, when I announced my candidacy, um, I had said I wanted to make sure that county government refocused its energies on the core service of what we were created for. You know, county government provides services. It's an engagement between residents and its government to provide police, fire, basic services. Pick up your garbage, make sure your parks are clean. And I would say post COVID, this is where we're gonna to have to focus on to make sure that the expectations of the taxpayer are being met and that we fund first the priorities that the taxpayers expect, understanding that they're gonna take a hit and that hit is gonna be reflected in revenue. We, we're gonna to need to live within our means. You know, this is not gonna be the time to be raising taxes. It's not gonna be the time to get kind of gimmicky. We're gonna to have to be able to fulfill 
the mission that our county government was designed to do in the first place. And that's where my priorities would be. Okay. Uh, uh, Commissioner Cobb, yes. So I've managed many budgets. I've run um, quite a few nonprofits and started dozens more. And, you know, we don't print money for nonprofits, nor do we in the county. So obviously we have to live within our means. And we were able to squeak by with the CARES Act dollars and the property taxes haven't been paid largely by March. Going ahead, we are definitely going to have a challenge. So I am going to enlist the help of our uh, workforce. How can we work smarter? How can we create efficiencies? How can we uh, start uh, jobs? You know, it's all about restarting the economy because the economy is what will drive our ability to pay for government services. So we have to look at how do we streamline permitting? How do we get uh, infrastructure projects moving quickly? All of that, putting people to work, making sure that they can pay their bills, making sure that includes they can pay their taxes without raising taxes and looking for efficiencies uh, in government. So I see it as a win-win-win opportunity because we definitely have ways that we should have been already looking to economize. Uh, and this is going to be a time when we're going to have to decide which programs are most essential. We'll have to be involved involving the public. And I will have a conversation with the public about what are the, the priority services okay. as we move forward. Commissioner, thank you. And Commissioner Bovo, I have seen your, your ads on television um, where you have compared uh, your opponent to the radical left. And I know that uh, the mayoral position in Miami-Dade County, like, uh, like they are in most of the country, are nonpartisan positions. But why do you think that she would not be a good mayor if elected uh, in November? <clears throat> well, I think that, uh, to be honest with you, I, I don't want to get into any kind of confrontation. Uh, my campaign has been from day one about making sure that the taxpayers' needs are being represented, plain and simple. You know, what we have seen across the nation is local governments designed specifically like Miami-Dade County government to provide services has gone down a path that no longer respects the taxpayer. People are fleeing places like New York, LA and San Francisco. They're leaving in droves because quite honestly, it's been become very expensive to live in those communities. And at the same time that the, the taxpayer basically is being completely disrespected and run over, their wishes are not being met. My concern, quite honestly, is that uh, my opponent accelerates that process here in Miami-Dade County. You know, she just finished talking about, you know, priorities. I don't need anybody to guide me in the priorities. I know what people engage their county government for. It is the reason you saw in the last 25 years four different areas incorporate themselves. And why did they do that? Because they wanted better services, better police, better fire, better code enforcement. That's why they incorporated. And they were willing to pay and tax themselves even more to get that kind of service. I'm, so I'm very clear on where, where the taxpayer of Miami-Dade County wants their priority and they want their priority in services. Okay, Commissioner Bobo, thank you. And uh... Commissioner Levine Cava, um, wrong person, wrong time. Do you think uh, that is right for Commissioner Bovo? Yes, I thank you. I think that's well said, Calvin. Look, I don't think he's listening to the people in his community. People are suffering. Yes, they want their potholes filled, but they also want to be able to pay the rent and put food on the table, take care of their families and not face homelessness. That's what local government is for, to take care of our people. They want a compassionate and caring government. That is not what he's presenting. Uh, someone said to me, is it potholes over people? <laughs> Look, we, we have the ability, government has always come forward in times of recession, in times of economy, because uh, economic crisis, because we can, and we can spend on infrastructure projects that create jobs. What about mental health? We all know we're reeling from a, a crisis, post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety. These things are hampering uh, our ability to, to get by as a community. Suicide rates are up, uh, domestic violence. You know, we cannot ignore these things just uh, because the, the, you know, potholes have to be filled. So I think it's a very, very narrow, tone deaf view. And there is nothing radical about taking care of people in our community. That's what local government does best. Commissioner Bobo, let me yeah, let me respond. First of all, don't tell me, uh, Commissioner Kava, about my people. I represent blue-collar people that work very hard. 
I don't know the liberal end that you might live in or fantasy, fantasy world that you live in. I deal in reality in my community. And in my community, people, yes, they're struggling. But what they don't want is government putting their foot on their throat. They want their taxes being spent the right way in their community. And they want government out of their lives, basically. And I will tell you, you know, you mentioned earlier about radical. I'll tell you where radicalism comes in. When we had an opportunity to create my legislation, which created 30,000 jobs in Miami-Dade County through Uber and Lyft, Commissioner Cabo voted against it because she doesn't understand what the need of our communities are, that people want to be able to get work, and they don't want government providing that work. I That's agree. the reality of our community. Commissioner Bob, i got to stop you there, and I did let you go um, a little extra. Um, Commissioner uh, Cabo, please go ahead. You have 30 seconds. Yeah, well, just to start with Uber and Lyft, of course, those are very convenient services. I use them, but they came into town, and they were without uh, without any regulation and, and flaunted it. They said there was no reason for them to follow any rules. And you know what? Uh, some people let them get away with it. And, you know, that's not right. It wasn't fair for the competition, for the hardworking taxi drivers that had been paying uh, their way. So now they're regulated, and so now it's fine. Uh, I'm happy to use their services. But uh, yes, I, I've spent a lifetime working with people who struggle. That, that has been my, my, my 40 years of service in this community. And in every corner of this community, people need a, a, a hand up. In every corner, they need help navigating s the service system, getting access to good jobs, training. That's exactly the kind of work that I've always done, and that's what people need. I'm going to stop you there. Okay. And uh, speaking of that uh, and the government help, let's, uh, let's transition into financial resilience. And uh, one question that was uh, proposed is before COVID, the United Way Alice report found that 17% of Miamians were in poverty and 37% were considered the working poor. How would you address poverty in Miami-Dade County? Commissioner Bobo, I'll begin with you. Well, you, you, what you try to do is encourage more education, more opportunities, diversify your economy in Miami-Dade County so that people can get better job skills and market themselves to be able to get better jobs. You know, we uh, constantly are talking in ways of increasing wages without maybe investing more in our community so that uh, job incubators, you know, that education foundations that could come in and create these great opportunities, people get better skills. They could command 20, 25, $30 an hour. You know, to me, one of the, one of the problems is again, when we go to local government, what is expected of our local government? And our local government is ill-equipped, ill-equipped to, to just create jobs at, at whim. On the contrary, maybe what we do is eliminate so much red tape, eliminate so many obstacles so that people could create jobs, create competitive nature in jobs. You know, I remind myself back in January, we were nearly at 1% unemployment in Miami-Dade County. That is fantastic numbers. Okay, I have to stop you there. And Commissioner uh, Cava, please go ahead. Right. Well, again, my career has been about lifting people out of poverty and the Alice report that the United Way puts out is so important for showcasing that it's not just about minimum wage, that the cost of living is so high here that, as you, you pointed out, it's more than half the people are barely getting by. And we have one of the uh, most uh, expensive housing market relative so, uh, to the income, so more than uh, people spending more than half of their money on housing alone. Uh, is the highest uh, in any metropolitan area. So this is obviously unsustainable. But we, it starts with, you know, um, Mr. Bovo mentioned incubators. Well, I have an incubator in my district. That was one of the recommendations that came out of the prosperity study that I uh, initiated, that City uh, Bank paid for and FIU produced. It had a range of anti-poverty initiatives and almost all of them are moving forward uh, with my uh, advocacy and some, of, some legislation. So children's savings accounts, um, uh, community land trusts that make housing more affordable long-term, uh, the incubators, uh, employees uh, getting together and owning a business. There's so many ways to do it. Okay. And Mr. Bovo, uh, she did mention you by name. Did you have a response at all? 30 seconds. No, no, no response. No response. Okay. Well, transit is a major issue. Obviously, if you don't have a way to get to work, um, it's impossible for you to be able to have some sustainable income. So our county needs structural reforms to the way transportation decisions are made. Would you both support the creation of an independent transportation authority to take politics out of transportation? Commissioner Bobo. No, no, I don't think we need to create any more government than we already have to be perfectly honest with you. 
I have worked ex exclusively on the issues of transportation for the better part now of six years, created other forms of, of funding. I have been supportive of traffic and, um, and transit initiatives. I supported making sure that we have a BRT, which is the building block for rail to the south end. My opponent uh, not only voted against it, she would have lost out on the $100 million of federal money that's going to help us there. I uh, created the legislation that opened the door for Uber and Lyft to work in our community legally. I mentioned already it created 30,000 jobs, also alternatives to mobility. She voted against that too. You know, the reality is the issues of transportation in our community are very complex because for a long, long time it was ignored. And every initiative that I have worked on that, that helps us now not only close the funding gaps, but also brings other, uh, other avenues to the table that we could move on transportation, she's voted against it. The Kendall Parkway, which would give folks an opportunity in Kendall, she's voted against that too. Leadership is taking tough decisions on this issue, not just simply voting no. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Calvo, please. So, yes, we have six corridors, and fortunately, one of them is underway. It wasn't what was promised. It wasn't what the mayor said in his reelection would come, which was an extension of Metro Rail. The uh, moving incrementally would have been uh, possible, would have been approved. It was at an adequate score, but unfortunately, the majority did not vote to honor that promise. So, BRT will be uh, a better solution. And I pushed forward for the synchronized traffic lights, which uh, I think, um, you know, we had to really push hard for that. There was a real resistance to moving forward and that's something that will help all of us. But at the end of the day, um, we have to address transit dependent as well as choice riders. So transit dependent are the people that have no choice and they're getting to work late. They're sitting in the sun and the rain, the seniors, the low income employees and, uh, you know, they're, it's not reliable. People might not even be given a job if they're told, if they say that they're reliant on transit. So we have a proposal that was uh, pioneered by a nonprofit group moving forward and, and hopefully we'll be able to move that quickly under my leadership, we will. But you did ask the question uh, initially about the uh, joint um, uh, transportation authority. And I will say that that would be ideal, but under the current funding structures, not possible, but I would create a body where all of those groups would plan together. To stop you there. And, and it sounds like the major difference between you two, uh, Commissioner Bovo, is the fact that you believe your opponent wants more government and you want less government in the lives of Miami-Dade, uh, folks who live in Miami-Dade County, correct? I think it's obvious. She, she has a government solution or position for almost every issue in Miami-Dade County. And, and I, uh, again, submit to you that uh, the responsibilities that we have as county government, if we fulfill those responsibilities, you know, the society could handle other issues in our community. The mayor could use the bully pulpit to push on those issues and make sure they're addressed. But as far as the county government is concerned, you know, this is where we fail. This is, again, I said the example, four areas, Miami Gardens, Miami Lakes, Palmetto Bay, Doral, all incorporated, not for lack of of, of social services, they wanted adequate county government, which at that point, county government was failing them at every turn. Your response, Commissioner. So I, I have been a member of the Greater Miami Chamber, trustee level for over 20 years. I've served as the representative from the commission as well to the Beacon Council. Um, I've earned uh, endorsements from many, many business people, most recently the Realtors Association, and it's a partnership, government, and business and civil society working together. That's what makes a healthy, a healthy community. Of course, the business community is a key part. We cannot do it alone. We, but again, in a pandemic, in a downturn, government can jump start. So now we have RISE, which is a uh, revolving loan fund. I'll invite the financial services community to come to the table and help us match. I'll bring financial institutions to the table about the potential mortgage foreclosure crisis and say, where can we all uh, give in a bit to make sure that we don't have uh, uh, that kind of downward spiral. We don't have any economic development leadership in Miami-Dade County government. I'll be appointing someone who will lead the way on finding opportunities. It's not a kind of an opportunistic thing, whoever comes along. You have to have a strategy. It has to be built on data. Federal Reserve called me and said, what are we doing to deal with the pandemic and the new dollars uh, that are coming or not coming? And we don't have anyone looking deeply at those matters. So under my watch, we will. Commissioner Cava, thank you. Let's turn now to affordable housing. The coronavirus crisis and the ensuing economic impacts 
have only deepened our economic inequalities and increased the amount of people struggling to afford our city. Our high housing costs are tied to having to compete with investors, speculators, and those looking for vacation homes who distort the local housing market. So what would you do to even the playing field and ensure the people who live and work here can afford our city? Commissioner Bobo. Well, you're gonna to have to have the relationships in Tallahassee to address this issue. We'd have to work with a property uh, appraiser to perhaps come up with the, the plans that those that are foreign investors and are buying our property uh, it gets uh, calibrated in a different way or at least assessed in a different way. You know, clearly when somebody comes in from abroad and pay sometimes top dollar or above asking price, it does absolutely uh, throw the entire market out of whack. And these are people that are not going to be living in our community. They may use it as rental. They may just be using it as emergency housing for the day they're going to flee their country. And that is unfair for a lot of the folks in our community. But it's going to take some tweaking in Tallahassee for flexibility in the law. And then at the same time, work with Pedro Garcia, our property appraiser, to assess these properties perhaps differently so it does not skew the market against those that live here and need access to housing. Hmm. Assess the properties differently. Uh, Commissioner Cobb. So I've been working on the issue of affordability and housing uh, for many years long before coming on the commission and served on a county task force and created another independent task force uh, involving the business community as well as the nonprofit sector. And there are many solutions. First of all, we have to recognize the crisis that it is. And we are fortunate to have the investors that we have, but we can't have it at the expense of our local uh, residents. So we do have county property, a good bit of it, that could be deployed rapidly. We do have surtax dollars that has been sitting on the shelf that we need to move forward rapidly. We have money in Tallahassee that's been diverted for all kinds of other purposes. Sadowski, we need to tap those dollars with the help of our day delegation. And we need to cut down on the permitting time uh, so that, because time is money. Uh, we need to, to move forward uh, to, to deploy uh, the lands, the permitting, everything to create as many as 10,000 units per year to get to a goal of, of an additional 100,000. And we need to refurbish those units that we have that are aging and might lose affordability. So long-term affordability is key. We can use our dollars as well to help people harden their homes so they can live in them longer. And, and do you support, uh, Commissioner Bobo, increased inclusion in all parts of society for individuals with disabilities? Why or why not? And if yes, what policies would you support to achieve this goal? Yes, of course. Nobody should be excluded from any kind of housing, uh, whether it's disability or any other reason for that matter. You know, the county owns a lot of land that could put in play. And the county does have the ability, and I've worked with our county to create all the incentives to cut as much red tape as possible. This is real work that we've done to entice developers. We have the ability once we start offering developers land that they could work on, we have the ability to give them more density. That more density would allow us to then extract from them units that we need for workforce housing, low income housing. I think there's a real play here. Now, we need to also be mindful. In many occasions, um, many in the board will balk and vote against any kind of development that comes as far as like an infield project because no one wants it in their neighborhood. And that's problematic. You know, if you're not, if, if you're not going to build beyond the UDB, if you're not going to allow any kind of, um, of development in areas that already are quasi-developed, then the problem is you're always going to be caught in this supply and demand situation. The only way to bring the price down of units is to increase the su supply, and you need to do it kind of drastic. Okay. Commissioner Bova and Commissioner Calvert, please. Your response. Uh, and I'm sorry. Again, the question? The question is, do you support increased inclusion in all parts of society oh, for individuals? Yes, yes, excuse me. Why or right. why not? And if you ask what policies would you support to achieve this goal? Yeah, actually, uh, Calvin, we were just talking with a representative of our disability uh, board recently about this, the lack of accessible housing. So it is really something that I do not think has been adequately prioritized as we've focused on affordability. Um, so I think you know, we really need to do an inventory of that and make sure that all of the projects we're approving are fully accessible. Um, we also have a problem of um, access to our public uh, amenities, our, 
our metro rail and our buses. The private buses that have been contracted are often coming without the adequate space for, they don't, might not have a lift, the lift might not be operable, there might not be room for more than one person in a wheelchair. And we have numerous examples of that, of people who've been left uh, in the dust, basically. And for the metro rail, the elevators and the escalators are often broken. I've inquired about it, it's lack of ability to maintain them properly, and I've proposed the county engage its own apprenticeship program so that we can maintain uh, accessibility. I don't think we've taken accessibility seriously enough in Miami-Dade County. Okay, and let's turn to the issue of criminal justice reform and social justice. Um, what policy changes do you intend to champion in order to address police brutality in Miami-Dade County? Commissioner Bovo. As mayor, I won't allow it, plain and simple. If somebody oversteps their, uh, their jurisdiction, their training, their protocols as a police officer, they won't serve under my administration. It's just plain and simple as that. that, as that. You know, we need to make sure that the police in our community is there to serve the community. And we, and I have been a big, big uh, promoter and supporter of the uh, Blue and Brown program to make sure that the community policing in our community is done the right way. People in our community want security and safety. Make no mistake about it. They want more police in their communities. That security and safety helps bring economic development, economic prosperity, helps bring jobs in communities. You know, sh I'll show you straight uh, streets that are safe and sound. I'll show you places that are blossoming. So that my reform is to make sure that we will not deviate from the policies and the protocols that is established to make sure that our police officers are serving our community, not the other way around. Commissioner Cava, please. Thank you. So I've spent um, a lot of my time on prevention work and focusing on children and keeping them out of a life of crime. And I'm really delighted that our police department in the county is very engaged in athletic programs and mentoring programs. Uh, we recently approved a grant that would help them to work directly in parks uh, with our children. I think these are all things that not only help the children and prevent crime, but also improve relations between the police and community. Uh, I was delighted last Friday to visit at the Training Bureau and learn that we truly have nationally recognizable uh, innovative approaches to uh, reviewing uh, police um, what happens in incidents, reviewing them with the police officers. Uh, we've added three months to the basic training to make sure that police learn the critical thinking uh, and um, how they respond and to get past their biases. So really we've made incredible progress. And just uh, today I spoke to Judge Steve Leifman, who of course is a leader in diversion uh, for those with mental illness. And he's told me how dramatically we've been able to, working with the police, reduce our jail population. Uh, and, by appropriate involvement on, on the appropriate treatment of those with mental illness. And Commissioner Bovo, I, I heard you say recently that you think that Commissioner Cava should apologize to the police department or to police officers in Miami-Dade County for marching with the Black Lives Matter movement uh, when that was going on uh, earlier this year. Why did you say that and why do you think she should apologize? Kellen, maybe you don't know, but it wasn't I that asked her to apologize. It was a letter written by the PBA, the South Florida PBA, for her offensive Twitter post that had included in it, all cops are bad. And I think that bad may be a different term, but A-C-A-B, she posted it on Twitter. And, uh, and, and clearly the, uh, the police departments have uh, taken offense to it. You know, this falls in line with a narrative that we have been seeing in our community some of the same people that are hosting this, uh, this, um, this forum, you know, have taken anti-police uh, positions. And, uh, you know, the FOP and the South Florida PBA are supporting my candidacy because I'm supporting them. I'm in line with the position of making sure that our communities are safe and sound. And quite honestly, uh, they've taken offense. It wasn't me that asked her to apologize. They asked her to apologize and she's never done it. Since June 3rd, they asked her to apologize in a letter that they have submitted uh, to her, and it's been basically ignored. And, and I'm going to stop you there. And in just one second, before I give you a chance to respond, uh, Commissioner Kava, uh, who are, who from the uh, the folks who are the organizers who uh, you feel were anti-police? Uh, I'll, I'll get. I'm sorry. Say that again. So, who who do you think from this forum is anti-police? Uh, because you mentioned that there were some people who were involved in this this forum who were anti-police. Um. 
I'd rather not get into that, to be honest with you, because I don't know if that's the focus. It's, this is not the focus about who's involved in this form, okay. but I'll, I'll be more than happy to demonstrate it later. Okay. All right. Commissioner Cava, please respond. Yes, thank you. So I have marched proudly after the murder of George Floyd with faith leaders, with elected leaders, with community leaders by my side peacefully and with law enforcement by my side. And our county police did an outstanding job of protecting everyone's rights to free speech. And of course, cracking down wherever there was any uh, chance of violence. And unfortunately, we did have a few incidents, but where I was marching, it was accompanied by all those people of conscience, of goodwill, uh, and, and with a supportive police force, I may say. That to be said, there was a post that in the background had a poster inadvertently posted. As soon as it was brought to my attention, having no idea that it was there or what it meant, we took it down. And the next day, I sent a letter of apology to every single law enforcement officer in Miami-Dade County Police Department. We do apologize. Uh, well, I could again clearly state that wasn't uh, the case. The, the South Florida PBA has not received that apology. And I would further state that the, the, what Chief's talking about, look, when you're a leader in our community, one of the things that you need to do is, is lower the temperature in our community, not run out with a megaphone and try to, to kind of pour gasoline on the situation. You know, what we had going on in Miami that night, I had a police officer from the city of Miami who, thank God, he had one of those uh, riot helmets on, the same riot helmet that many people say they shouldn't have because it militarizes our police department, had a helmet on that. Thank God he had it on because somebody threw a rock from the overpass of I-95 and hit him in the head. He'd be dead today if it wasn't for that helmet. These are the same people that are also setting cars on fires. You know, as a leader in our community, we need to temper down, the, simmer down, the, the temperament of people that wanted to go out and just destroy property and assault police officers. I agree. And, and you feel like Commissioner May, may I, I feel respond? Like Please, go ahead. Commissioner Cobb, go ahead. Well, I think, uh, unfortunately, he's the one pouring the, uh, the, the fuel on the flames because I marched peacefully. I sent an email the next day. Uh, it's on the record. Happy to share it with everyone. And this is a persistent uh, drumbeat uh, from Mr. Bobo that somehow is basically filled with lies that I would defund police, which I've never voted to decrease the police budget, quite to the opposite. And uh, it's, it's really very offensive. And it's, it's designed to create fear. Uh, and it, it's, that's what it is. It's, it's fear mongering and uh, unfortunately like a, like a dog whistle. So I'm really, really sorry that this persists. And, and Commissioner Combo, so the term defunding police I think uh, needs to be sort of unpacked for some people because it, in, in some ways, now not for all, I can't speak for everyone, but for many of the people who are saying defund police, they're saying redirect some of the resources of the police department into other departments. Are you in favor of redirecting resources? Are you in favor of defunding police? What are you in favor of? Well, I'm certainly not in, in favor of defunding because I haven't voted a single time and have pledged never to vote to defund those, those budgets. They've increased every year with my support. In fact, I've lobbied for more. And in addition, can we get uh, more services to prevent crime? For sure. That is exactly what we need to do. And just like we approved a grant uh, that would provide uh, the police working in the parks with the children, that's an alternative. Just like we have a mental health service uh, for our police officers, many of whom are, are really struggling and suffering from uh, the difficulties they're facing. That's so critical. Uh, th these are all programs that are necessary as part of our service delivery. And yes, uh, oftentimes uh, they're hard to find from the current budget. But you know, this is the difference between the two of us. I've spent a lifetime collaborating to get things done. I've spent a lifetime creating coalitions. I've spent a lifetime working with the philanthropic sector and the private sector to come together and invest in things that will make a difference. I was at, on the front lines lobbying for the Children's Trust. That has been transformational for our community. That's the kind of work I'll do as mayor. Mr. Bobo. Yeah, uh, no count. Um, okay. Defund police means defund police. There's no gimmick, no language around it. The July 8th memo, which spoke to a piece of legislation, so let's be clear, and I want to make sure that Commissioner, just refreshing Commissioner Kava's memory on this. The memo, I reviewed it. The, yeah, the, well, the memo goes to an ordinance that you co-sponsored and was very clear. The first iteration, which moved $7.5 million 
from the police budget, because that's what it called for. You supported it. Perhaps you didn't realize what was going on at the time. Perhaps you didn't realize that many folks in our community, in fact, the vast majority of the folks in our community are not down with defunding the police. So not only did you vote for it on that time, and then every iteration afterwards. And defunding the police, it doesn't matter if it's $1 or $7.5 million. Defund the police means taking away money from the police department, period. End of story. You've been supportive of that because the radical left in our community is endorsing that position. And that's what you have endorsed. You have supported that position, plain and simple. You know, the, the, May this, I respond? Make it, this is the kind of thing that if you would have, the, the, the training center you said that you went and visited, quite honestly, wouldn't even existed if you take $7.5 million out of the police budget. Above all, I'm going to give her a chance to respond. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So there was an item that suggested that the cost of 1% of a budget, uh, it wasn't an item, excuse me, it was a memo. It was never even voted on. And immediately Commissioner Jordan, to clarify, came back and said very clearly to the commission, and Mr. Bovro was there just like me, that the money would not come from the police budget, and it hasn't come from the police budget. So this was her item, I was a co-sponsor of the item, it was never intended to take that money out of the police budget for the independent civilian panel. Uh, so no attempt whatsoever. And I'm really surprised that you're persisting in this because clearly the, the record speaks for itself. Yes, there is an item to fund the independent civilian panel. It is in the budget, it's been approved, and it is not part of the police budget. And been. never was it proposed to be. And, and I do want to be clear. It you? Actually it was, and the memo and, said very clearly, if implemented, Daniela, you, you signed on to a piece of legislation that clearly stated where the money was going to come from. They were going to take it away from the police you're, department. You're confusing no, 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 things. I'm not confusing you it. You are you're confusing, confusing it. It's not a popular things. thing. It's not a popular thing to take it away from the police. And you now realize it. Like, no, no, sir. It, that's basically. not correct. So, that is not correct. Okay, so I, he had about and, a and second, so 15 have... seconds to respond for you, please. Okay. Let's be clear, in 2014, Mr. Bovo himself initiated and voted to take away 80 positions in the budget from police, as well as to make them pay more out of their salaries for health insurance. And by the way, why did the PBA support me in 2014 and again in 2018? Because of these kinds of anti-labor policies. So they stood with me on that occasion. They don't want an independent civilian panel. They didn't want uh, cameras. They did not want cameras. The cameras have proven to be useful. I know the independent civilian panel will prove to be for their benefit to and, go and press. Let me stop you there. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, they're supporting me. They're not supporting you because I support them. That's why they're supporting me okay. and the FOP. All right, let's move on to another hot topic. Clearly, this is one of them, but, uh, but let me move on to another here. And this is for uh, climate change. Uh, Mr. Bobo, you have been accused of not having um, a solid record on environmental protection. Um, what, what is your response to that to your critics? Well, I don't know who the critics are. I've collaborated on legislation that not only holds uh, uh, FPL accountable, water use issues. I'm the one that created the, uh, the resolution to declare an emergency in uh, Key Biscayne. I'm very aware of the situations that are going on. I've been one of the lone conservatives at one time that would speak about these issues of the environment. I fully understand the treasure that we have in Miami-Dade County, not only the Everglades, the Bay, our, our beaches. I sponsored legislation on, on beach renourishment. You know, I'm more than, uh, than aware of what's going on in our community as far as the environment is concerned. Now, what I don't do is to submit to the extreme on these issues on these issues because quite honestly many of these issues have to be approached in a comprehensive kind of way that protects uh, a lot of the folks that own homes it protects a lot of businesses high rises it has to be done in a collaboration in fact a lot of my transportation plan speaks to resiliency because of this the same issue we're going to have to de develop and build differently in the future of miami-dade county to lessen our impact as far as the, the um, sea level rise and global issues are concerned. Commissioner Bobo, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cava, please. Thank you. So I have been at the forefront of environmental policies at the County Commission. I uh, identified the die off of the seagrass three years ago, uh, brought it to the Commission, 
uh, pioneered the first uh, health, Biscayne Bay Health Summit, uh, legislated to create an annual report card, which is two years in delay, uh, legislated to bring back the uh, septic to sewer priority conversion areas because understanding that septic is a key part of the problem. Um, my opponent uh, finally got religion when there were tens of thousands of dead fish and jumped on it to declare an emergency, which clearly had existed for some time. As a state legislator, he voted to support offshore drilling. So, you know, this, he, I said, he is Johnny come lately to the environmental side of things. Uh, hopefully he'll be supportive in the future, but this is not an area where he has led. I've enjoyed the support of every environmental group that endorses, very, very proud of it because they know that I recognize the urgency of protecting our environment for the future of our health and our economy. Mr. Vallow, 30 seconds to respond. She did uh, sort of call you out there on your record. That, that's fine. She could call me all she wants. My responsibility as a legislator, my responsibility as a commissioner is to make sure that I protect the, the property values and the quality of life of the residents of Miami-Dade County. I will do that as mayor. And as I've said over and over again, I will work in a way that we will not cripple our economy when you turn over all these issues to the extremes on these issues, what you do is have moratoriums, you have uh, policies that are crippling, that devaluate properties in many cases. This has to be dealt with in a comprehensive kind of way, in a very level and common sense kind of way, and I'll do that as mayor. And I am going to go over a little bit. We were supposed to end at 8 o'clock, but because we had those technical issues in the beginning, uh, we're going to go over our time just a little bit here. So. Just wanted to let the uh, folks who are participating with us at home understand that. Uh, Biscayne Bay is worth more than $60 billion in ecosystem goods and services. The 2019 study by Miami-Dade County illustrated that the Bay is dying and nutrient pollution is a leading cause of impairment to the Bay. The city of Miami recently passed the most robust fertilizer ordinance in the state to address nutrient runoff. How would you address nutrient pollution and stormwater runoff at the county level? Uh, Commissioner Kava, I'll begin with you on that question. Thank you so much, uh, Calvin. And as I said, I have been leading on this issue for several years. My ordinance to uh, reduce fertilizer going into the Bay is on the agenda for tomorrow. Uh, I believe that uh, Commissioner Ken Russell from the city of Miami told me he's going to be speaking to it and he says it goes further than his in the city. The city was ahead of us as along with North Bay Village. Um, but this is something that I've learned about because of my study and concerns about uh, the, the integrity of our, of our water basin. And as I said before, this is our economy, this is our health, we can't afford uh, to, to, you know, risk that by uh, continuing our, our practices of pollution. The septic to sewer is obviously an expensive infrastructure rebuild. The Florida Keys did it. They did it um, over a period of time. They had state dollars as well. And of course, we're going to need support from our state and federal government. But we've also, uh, I've pushed, and I'm very happy to say that the Water and Sewer Department has acknowledged that we can use some of the uh, future fund that they uh, use to connect future uh, for, for people in the future that we're going to use it for what's called the laterals to go up the streets from the mains uh, and that will help to reduce the, 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 the price tag. There's about 300 homes okay. that are the ones that are most uh, susceptible and ready to be converted immediately. Okay, Mr. Bovo and you. I think it, it needs to uh, be dealt with in a couple of fronts. The, one of the first things that needs to be done is address the septic tank issue and it will take state help, that's how Monroe did it. It was almost exclusive state dollars that did it and we're gonna to need to invest heavily uh, on our state partners. I supported a bill that was being run by Representative Avila and Senator uh, Diaz that would help move some tourist funds over into this space so that we could help with the connectivity. You know, one of the things that the, the cost involved is when you convert to sewer is making sure property lines can get it connected to the sewer lines. That could be very, very expensive if you have to run these laterals for, you know, for blocks and blocks. So I think there's an area that we could help. We could help homeowners and building owners that uh, qualify for the Y Green program to have that final connection. That allows them to help spread these payments out uh, over a period of time, which I think is something that we are gonna all want to insist on. And we're gonna have to have a conversation with these property owners that, that have to understand. It not only helps them directly, but also helps us globally in our, in our community. And as I said earlier, look, I, I'm more than aware that the Bay creates economic opportunity, creates property value. We need a healthy Bay 
these are the steps that we have to take to make sure that the, this bay is not only kept pristine, it's also kept for future generations. Thank you. And, and uh, Commissioner Kava, I, which was, I mean, he, he sort of touched on my next question is, how, how would you accelerate the effort to convert uh, septic to sewer? Well, as I said, Calvin, I have a report still pending that fortunately I got briefed about by the authors in our administration uh, that identified exactly what we need to do. The first 300, the next 1,200 homes, we need to aggressively uh, build those what are called laterals that go from the main lines down the street and then help those uh, residents afford to pay the connection fee to their home. There's really no time to waste. Also, we are spending money on major projects that maybe aren't priorities. I mentioned uh, in another forum, the money that's going out to the American Dream Mall that's costing us a lot of money uh, that, you know, really turns out to be a subsidy to that project, whereas those are dollars that could well be spent to protect our, our water uh, integrity in the future. So, you know, this is, th there's no playing around with this situation. We just saw tens of thousands of dead fish and there was another fish kill over this weekend, not as large. You, you know, what, what is it gonna take to recognize that our very future is at stake. Mr. Bovo, any response at all? Well, you need to address it. That's, that's plain and simple, you need to address it. What may be a little bit misleading is that she talks about money being invested in the mall that quite honestly won't happen unless the mall's built and they generate their own revenue so that they could go ahead. We don't have that money just laying around to be perfectly honest with you. But that's what right. we do need to do is have a conversation. We need to have a conversation with all the homeowners and all these, uh, you know, basically along the, the shoreline and explain to them what it's going to take. You know, when people are talked to in a transparent way, when they understand that this is going to help their property values, I think that uh, they have shown the disposition to be able to cooperate and help. This, this, this is not a, one of these kind of things that you just put to the side. It's, again, one of the many things that I, as mayor, are going to have to handle, not only is the economic recovery, deal with these issues of the laterals and deal with the issues of connectivity and get people off of uh, septic tanks, but also the transportation issues. I mean, all these are very complex things all moving at the same time. You know, this is not uh, something that is, uh, that is something that hopefully somebody could do a study or, or write letters about. We're going to have to get into the trenches and get these things done and be transparent with the people as we're getting them done. Yeah, they're all interconnected. Uh, he did mention you by name, uh, Commissioner Convey. You have uh, 30 seconds to respond. I did? <laughs> In you know, my name? Yeah. Well, I do just want to be well, not clear. Necessarily. You, you yeah, actually yeah. Said, you uh, said To be chief, clear about the, the, the American Dream Mall, it was cooked into the approval. And of course, I voted against it. It was cooked into the approval to provide the trunk line. Uh, out to the development. So it's not something that is waiting. It's something that's already been approved and it's a huge, huge pipe that's contemplated. And those dollars, again, are really a subsidy to that development, which we could use today uh, to help us protect our bay. So today we've established you not only uh, killed 30,000 Uber Lyft jobs, uh, you would have voted against it, and you kill another 40,000 jobs that perhaps this mall would have been able pr to produce in our community. So, you know, 70,000, we could use those 70,000 jobs now uh, during the uh, COVID recovery. Right. How about, may I? Yes, please. Thank you. How about the jobs that I'm going to create building the infrastructure that we need for things like uh, transit and uh, water and sewer and uh, uh, septic uh, to sewer conversion? Uh, you, those you, are the you, kinds you of jobs. Wait for the... uh, re excuse me. Yeah. Instead of... Uh, creating another mall when people are not going shopping so much at malls right now. Uh, and um, they did not agree to not come back for subsidy. And by the way, they're having a terrible time in New Jersey. So exactly what jobs they'll be creating, uh, I'm not sure. Well, Quick again, to respond. Go ahead, the, county, the county doesn't create malls. The county creates conditions and opportunities. Okay. You won't create any jobs and infrastructure because you will probably wait for something to happen because you need to be able to pull the trigger. Instead of voting no on every issue, perhaps when you start voting yes on certain issues, then maybe, just maybe, but it won't matter because I'll be the mayor, I'll take care of these things. Okay, and so, right. and so we, we have some audience questions here, Thank so um, uh, we, we're, we're gonna try to get to as many of these as I can before I have to wrap up here. Gloria from Miami says, top three priorities in the first 100 days. I'll begin with you, Mr. Bowell. I think uh, economic uh, recovery of our, uh, after this whole pandemic, really becomes one, two, and three. 
But I think that is first and foremost, work on the septic tank issue and transportation. I think those are the three top things, but understand that getting our economy up and running is going to be a lengthy process. Ms. Collins. Public health, false, false uh, dichotomy. We have to have an adequate public health system, a chief medical officer to guide us, make sure people are getting the testing, we're doing the contact tracing, which by the way, people are more aware of now that uh, the president came down with COVID. They're doing some robust contact tracing, I can assure you, around uh, that super spreader event. And then isolation, because not everybody can go home to the White House and isolate. You have to have a place to go. And fortunately, we do have a block of hotel rooms uh, that are being uh, utilized at this time. And then investing in our small businesses, helping them to get out of the hole that they are in uh, with loans, with technical assistance, the incubator that I created in South Dade, taking that kind of technical assistance and mentoring work countywide and infrastructure projects that will create well-paid, good jobs. Uh, and, um, and then moving forward into the future okay. to uh, rebrand our tourism economy, make sure people know we're ready and open for business. Uh, and, and those will be my top priorities. Okay. And, and Mr. Bovo, uh, Dahlia from Cutler Bay. Since 1989, there has been a dog breed ban. What is your position? Well, I've supported taking it to the voters on more than one occasion. And the voters, uh, Dahlia, have already spoken. And, uh, you know, I've been supportive of taking it to the voters. The voters have spoken on this item. And unfortunately, you know, they have banned pit bulls in Miami-Dade County. Uh, Mrs. Cava, please. Yeah, well, you know, of course, as mayor, we don't legislate, but I certainly think that it's something that we need to wait, you know, have an opportunity. It was a long time ago. It's time to educate the public and see where they stand. Uh, Suzanne from Miami, what is your plan for parks and open space? Mr. Bovo. Well, it falls right in line what I have been saying from day one, what county government's job is. In that wheelhouse of importance is public parks and space. You know, I grew up in our park programs spend my entire life basically as a as a kid playing in the parks and to me to see you know our parks having to cut the grass once every month or every two months it's it just outrageous no programming in our parks you know this is this is not the Miami-Dade County that I grew up in but unfortunately if you start stretching the county dollar uh, to areas that it can't fulfill the programs that start to wane are the ones that we most uh, depend on and the ones that we pay for Okay, and final question. Uh, final Do I get to answer that yes, one? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So parks is one of the areas that in my first year in office, I was able to uh, bring back some serious uh, rehabilitation of our parks. It was when the uh, maintenance had gone to a very low level. Uh, parks was sort of a stepchild. Programming had ended, buildings were dilapidated. And uh, with the uh, partnership actually with the Miami Foundation, uh, the Parks uh, Foundation and others, uh, people signed petitions, they organized, and 20% uh, funding was restored to parks. That's how important parks are. And now more than ever, we see the open space parks have, uh, and libraries uh, have become, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the important places uh, to recover uh, for all of us. Now for the closing statements. You have exactly two minutes. I'll get my clock set here. And we began with Commissioner Kava, we are going to allow Mr. Bovo to begin the closing statements. You have two minutes, Mr. Bovo, please. Go uh, ahead. Thank you, Calvin, and thank you for the, to the foundation for offering us this opportunity. You know, Miami-Dade County is uh, entering into a crossroad. It really is, and this election is extremely important for, for many, many reasons. Uh, voters are going to be asked to decide what direction do they want to have their county go in. Uh, my offer is very simple to readdress the issues, refocus our county government, and make sure that the core issues that we expect uh, rendered are being taken care of, making sure our streets are safe. We won't defund police, and we're going to make sure that our community offers economic opportunities by making sure we have safe streets. We're going to fund the core services, garbage, parks, water and sewer. This is what you engage county government to, to do for you. Now, we're going to go through some difficult times on the horizon, the tale of COVID-19, and as long as the, the, the pandemic is around, we're going to have to learn to live with it. And as your mayor, I'm going to work with small businesses. I'm going to make sure that they could open in ways that are safe and that you as a customer of these businesses could feel safe. It's the only way that we're going to be able to build better, I'm sorry, build back in a way that makes our community a lot better. As your mayor, 
I pledge to you, we're going to move our county forward. We're not going to move our county backwards, and we're going to do it in the right way. We're not going to become Portland. We're not going to become Chicago or New York or any other of these radical run cities that have lost their way. And again, I want to thank all of you. Hope you all stay safe and look forward to the next time that we could all see each other, but not in this kind of format. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Bobo. And let me set my clock here. Okay, Commissioner Cava, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Calvin. Thank you, Miami Foundation and to all of our viewers. Clearly this election poses some very uh, stark questions to the residents about who we want to be as a community and how we are going to overcome these challenges. Um, and let me just say, there's nothing radical about me except that I'm radically honest, radically innovative and radically collaborative. So in the 40 years that I have called Miami-Dade County home, I have come to know our people and we are resilient and we are kind and we are resolute. So 2020 is an opportunity to elect a mayor who not only appreciates these characteristics, but who also has made and will continue to make a concerted effort to invest in our people and to unlock our potential. I've always believed that growth begins from the ground up and that investments in previously forgotten of our community, forgotten corners of our community, will create a rising tide that will truly lift all of our boats. It's not enough for public officials to pay lip service to these beliefs. You have to have a mayor that will set a clear path forward and make them a reality. Plans to ensure that the community will live in the, in the way that reflects the values that we all hold dear. So my vision for our future is very clear. We need to have greater access to capital for small businesses, investments in green energy and infrastructure. We need to uproot the longstanding racial inequalities that are apparent in County Hall, not seen by my opponent apparently, and greater coordination with our state delegation to ensure that the state of Florida no longer takes the contributions of our people for granted. So despite the challenges we face, I am incredibly optimistic about the future of our community and the reason for my optimism again is you. You have inspired me. I'm incredibly excited to earn your vote, number 81 on the ballot. Let's win this thing. Thank you. All right, and that's exactly one minute and 59 seconds. That's pretty good. Um, so that marks the end of uh, this forum for the Miami Foundation. And uh, thank you for allowing me to be your moderator. Um, and I do wanna remind everyone that today is the final day to register to vote in November. You must do it before midnight tonight to change your address, to change your party affiliation. Do it tonight before midnight. And don't forget to vote in the general election coming up on November 3rd. To both commissioners, thank you. Commissioner Dan Daniela Levine Cava and Steve Bobo, thank you very much for your time tonight. I know your schedules are quite busy and good luck to you both in November. Thank you. Thank you.